set of copper slash brass horses. We only need artifacts. Hello everyone and welcome to Performance Anxiety's 45th live online reading event. My name is Tom Snarsky and I'm so thrilled and thankful to be here with you, getting back into our monthly swing with tonight's reading. In case you haven't listened in before, Performance Anxiety is an online reading series of mostly poetry, but not always, as one of our readers will remind us, hosted via Skype, usually on the third Thursday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. At each of our events, we feature a group of invited readers to share a selection of their work with us. Having slots for readers every month means we're always looking for folks who'd be interested in reading. So if you are or know a poet or writer who'd be interested in sharing their work at a future event, please get in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. Um, we're on Twitter at Performance Anxiety, which is P-E-R-F-O-R-M-A-N-C-E-A-N-X-T, so not quite the whole second word. Um, or you can DM or email us the co-organizers directly. I'm at Tom Snarsky on Twitter and Instagram, T O M. S-N-A-R-S-K-Y, or you can email me. We use our logistical email is poetrybooksontape at gmail.com. You can also get in touch with Kristen Garth, who is Performance Anxiety's other co-organizer and who I'm also very excited to introduce as our first reader of the evening. So without any further ado, Kristen Garth is a Pushcart Whistling nominated sonneteer and a Best of the Net 2020 finalist. She's the author of a short story collection, Daddy, coming this fall from Anxiety Press and many more books. So Kristen, I appreciate you taking us off script a little bit to read some uh, fiction tonight. So take it away. <laughs> Excited to hear what you're going to share. Thank you. I have a, a little horror story um, that I'm going to read to you tonight. And if I, um, I'm a little medicated. So if I um, have a it, you know, just bear with me, but um, anyway, it's a little scary, but it's also a little sweet. Sugar Daddy. Sorry, Daddy says, watching you assembling a gummy burger from its miniature components. Orange circle buns, bubblegum pink patty, and a translucent lime green pickle. On the Dior Lily of the Valley saucer that serves as your dinner plate. I didn't mean for you to have to actually cook. It's why I have people. He leans forward to extend a finger towards the button at the center of the table, which summons his chef, Evan, or his assistant, Luke. No matter who responds, he is going to lose his cool on someone just because of your persistence in playing with your food. No, Daddy, I'm sorry. It's my fault. I took it apart. The real problem is the thoughts. Where do you get these terrible thoughts? Thoughts that make your fingers seek distraction at the dinner table to avoid disturbing your sugar daddy so much his face twists. A sugar girl would never have seen such things. They must have come from inside of you, an invention of a sour soul. Daddy never, uh, daddy speaks none of this though. He will focus on the fidgeting as it is what sours him. Last night it was fiddling with the sour spaghetti and gummy balls. You are not a little girl anymore, Diana. Ma ma manners matter. He is scowling, and it's when he scowls at you, which is admittedly not often, you remember how much he resembles a famous flipper outer of reality TV, Jeff Lewis. Though he certainly cannot be Jeff Lewis because he is your daddy and you know what his name is. His name is, well, now you can't seem to remember what his name is. He's your father, though, not some famous OCD TV curmudgeon. It's just daddy, life is sweet and simple. Stop trying to make it otherwise. Pick up a yellow gummy fry and sprinkle it with extra sugar from the shaker. Chew it daintily in a way that must be adorable because daddy smiles. The tension in your stomach dissipates with his scowl and the nagging thought, this is not your daddy, but some kind of a trick. Swallow a piece of a gummy cola and you feel sated and simple again, like yourself, a sugar girl. Nightmares have happened for years. Don't dare speak their details in the daylight over gummy sprinkled donuts and cold brew bears. The details are a dark loneliness offset by a TV screen. Don't try to remember any more about it. Something inside you screams. It's the only illumination in the room you should not try to think about. Um, besides the hot pink of a plastic lamp at your side. Try not to forget the coterie of plushies and the large pink bed. There's a loneliness only broken by invaders who come in intervals, never sure how long. Sometimes they come while you sleep. Who knows how long they have been there? How long have you kept the secrets of this sour place? In this should be forgotten place, 
It isn't a sugar girl sleeping, but the sour nightmare south. The invaders arrive with belts and knives and plastic bags, expose parts of a body a sugar girl has never seen, do things to the sour girl a sugar girl could never repeat to anyone, especially not the most saccharine of fathers over cherry gelatinized lobsters and rosé bears, blessedly awake. Confess once over gummy pizza, merely the description of the space you go to in your sleep and the dread that overcomes your, you hearing bodies on the stair. Don't say more because daddy's face becomes dour enough. His lips don't move for minutes while your fingers fidget with the gelatinous pepperoni pieces until he says stop and you think he means the dreaming and how you wish you might stop the dreaming, but he means the fidgeting. So you hold your hands gracefully in your lap because at least you can give him this. At bedtime, daddy doles out two purple sleeping gummies and an admonition to stay sweet, even asleep. It hurts this admonition because it feels like an accusation. You aren't inventing these things in your cotton candy brain. You aren't participating in these acts. They happen and they affect you. Even awake, nibbling crispy gummy bacon and sunny side up eggs, you'll fidget with your napkin or the gummy pa pancake, usually your favorite, not to make eye contact with your sweet daddy, sour sleep still in your eyes. Cry yourself to cruel con unconsciousness this night, realizing you no longer belong in the sweet life. Your candy coating is wearing thinner each day. Soon the rot of your insides, the truth of your sour nature is going to show. This time, when your eyes shut and your skeleton awakes in the jaw breaking sour place, you force yourself to look deeper into the room, to investigate and to remember. Understand at last that this place defines you too, whether you try to keep sweet or not. Alone in the pink darkness, you feel entombed in a bubblegum grave. The TV is loud. Hear a voice that sounds as comforting as grains of sugar pouring from a shaker, even though you, you realize it is yelling. Not yelling at you, of course. You aren't inside the screen with it, but at the crew. That is, a team who have done a terrible job tiling a bathroom floor. It is daddy, but he is as sour as this place you find yourself inside. You can't turn your eyes from the screen until the show ends. Watch this. Watch the seconds in the right-hand corner count down until the next episode of Flipping Out. Fill your body, its bruises and aches. It is heavy and sad. In the sugar world, it occurs to you, you never fill your body at all for any good or bad reason. It is, is it because the sweet place isn't real at all? Is it just a dream? And this nightmare is the actual life you live? Here creaks on the stairs descending towards this pink sour place. Sob at the sound in the sight of the commercial that pops up on the television for gummy bears. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen, for getting us started tonight with that beautiful story. And again, that is from Kristen's new book, Daddy, which is coming out this fall from Anxiety Press. Um, Kristen is always doing so many amazing things. Um, so you can find Kristen on Twitter at Lola and Jolie, L O L A. A N D J O L I E it is like Basil says, don't forget Instagram. I won't because Kristen is on Instagram at Kristen Ingrid Garth, K R I S T I N I N G R I D G A R T H, which is also the spelling of her website, kristengarth.com. So you can keep up with Kristen's awesome stuff, um, books that she's writing, a publication. We were talking about how she's got a sub stack earlier uh, tonight, so you can subscribe to that. There's all kinds of amazing stuff. And also, please reach out to her if you'd like to read her performance anxiety her or me. Um, yeah, fabulous. So we couldn't be off to a better start. And I'm really excited to keep this going with our next reader, who I'm really excited to introduce as William Erickson. William Erickson is a living poet. Find his work now or later in Sixth Finch, West Branch, Ghost City, Sprung Formal, etc. William's first collection comes out in 2024 with April Gloaming. He lives with his partner and two pups in an old house across a busy street from a tree. William, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Basil's like, stop talking and let him read. So I will do that. Take it away. Um, thank you. This is cool. Um, it's like amazing and intimidating to be in the company of poets I so admire. So um, I really appreciate it. 
it feels extra special. It's really nice outside right now and still light here. So like, this is rad. Um, I'm gonna do a thing I was just talking about not doing ever again, and that's reading poems from my phone. Um, but these are so new as to not have made it to a computer yet. Um, I've, uh, most of my poetry or a lot of it sort of eschews reality in a way. Um, and I've been, for whatever reason, trying to lean away from that and back into like certain kinds of reality. So I've been working with um, like very specific memories of very specific places and sort of like dwelling in those places and trying to create a space out of those places. Um, and I don't know how these poems are going to sound. Um, they might have sort of like a, a high rhetorical gravitas that is pretentious. I'm not sure yet. Um, but one of these poems is going to end up in Sprung Formal, I think, in spring. And Sprung Formal is um, one of my favorite mags. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so yeah, I'll just read a few of these things. It's kind of a, a, a sequence of poems. Um, a map of forest roads up to Cinnamon Peak. Cinnamon Peak is uh, a little tiny hill just a little bit southwest of uh, Mount St. Helens. Um, and my dad and I used to go up there all the time. There's like a little cross up there where some guy I don't know probably had his ashes scattered and it's a, a cool little spot. Um, a map of forest roads up to Cinnamon Peak. A mountain is the beach of no thing. This cinnamon grass, dried skull of earth, I tow the cusp of God's eye to enact one type of vanishing. Though from every way to be a ghost, I choose the one that grows the salmon berries. Um, so another one, uh, beach sunset, I do not recall. It is unclear whether where we sit, we watch tomorrow entered into the cut peach, the sky, my eyes returning what's been rented by my body, by my body from a stand of beach grass, memory engulfs the grandfather clock. Um, I used to get really bad uh, night terrors when I was a kid. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night and see shadows on the walls and whatever. Um, and it was a, a source of anxiety that I still feel pretty palpably in a sense. Um, yeah, for what it's worth. Turning on the hall light, a night tremor. Between the hallway walls, the rough ceiling of want from which a sun suspends in the thin glass globe where, for example, two small moths bathe perfectly still in cold months. We all were scared of the harmless bite of the light switch. Uh, and now I'm editing this document, which is the terror of reading on my phone. I'll read maybe a couple more from this series and then we'll kind of switch gears. Central Oregon Pine Meadow. Night breathes as if to bellows the blackened pupils, the sky a verb in the sentence of my broken sleep. I must cover my mouth to speak sincerely, slip into a stone jacket to speed the ripening. A night will press its palm into my cheek. I do assume this that my real bed is built of clock springs. Uh, we'll just do one more of these. In rain, late afternoon, Lahar, Lava Canyon. What cannot stay inside the earth becomes the earth. My eye relates the graying light of constancy to that God who says the sum of days might make a sudden partner of one's need for static just to sleep. I hand its hand two smaller hands that cast my suffering beyond me like a flashlight. 
Okay. Switching gears, a few prose poems. Um, these are um, these are not realities. Two thousand seven for lightning. Who could explain the joy of my joy? If you could imagine your bones as sticks of old timey dynamite, the black braided fuses ribboned from your fingers like wisteria vines. In every eye, a quasar spinning a beam to which the roof of the world is affixed. I must house myself separately from myself for the sake of my joy, regarding its reflection from the edge of the swimming pool, its lungs filled ever so uneasily. Uh, this one is called Cliché. One of the mountains did not sprout legs. As the others stood and shook the plates with their slow and stupendous steps, the legless mountain sat. See from the roof the stillness it possesses? It's neverthelessness, I mean. How ceaseless change invites itself upon the fact of durability. How, too, the opposite. Every morning, my love and I lace up our hiking shoes, knowing with certainty the spider's lightless home will be crushed by an insistent sky. Okay. This poem is called Mirror Bevel. My happiness is nearly done in the dishwasher, the drupples of water shrinking from shadows of the fine white dust on its skin. It bathes above the smoldering element awaiting the song. It softens into the containment of its own false day. As a matter of routine, the appliance repairman rings the doorbell before he knocks. He says he is not a locksmith, says he comes from church, where a week's godlessness was drained from him to drape in the window and dry. The plastic latch clicks in his hand. He claims that the dishwasher is working, working perfectly, but I know damn well the sashes of his ears are painted shut. When I was just a boy, I wanted nothing more than to know how nature could stand my constant scrubbing. Um, tire store. I got angry with my pleasure. Every day we kiss, and every day my lips grow lips, whose lips grow lips, whose lips grow lips, until the house is filled with speech. Each morning, there's an eye that stays asleep inside the speech's endless twins. It's thickening country of thrashing foliage. In its sleep, the eye is as blind as a small pile of sand. I know I should like the desert, but it makes me think of the rusty Camaro I found filled with mice in a field and how its seats held me ever so tenderly that I could not sleep any place else. Uh, I'll just do two more. Wire Garden Gate. My happiness is deathly afraid of sinning and deathly afraid of prayer. It sits up all night, chalk, chalking tick marks on the blackboard crossing out every fourth line with a fifth diagonal line. What could one possibly know of the vanishment time assigns to every effort? On Sundays, we clap the chalk erasers and the neighborhood children do their skateboard trips. Down the street, our dust clouds settle, blunting just a little the blood red rhododendron blooms. I am not afraid of sin, but seeing art hanged on a wall is horrifying. And last poem, Leadfoot. My joy is one day of a 10 day trip across the United States. Not the day I stopped for gas beneath the fiberglass Tyrannosaurus teeth. Not the day I saw the sign that read speed enforced by air. Not the day the Denny's window faced a cemetery where the families cleared years of grass with tuning forks but the day I put a dollar in the hotel ice machine to learn how one contains a coldness. Funny to think somewhere a breath will just stop you on the street. Thank you uh, so much again for having me and for listening. Um, this is amazing. I love the series so much. So it's like, it's a real treat for me. 
thank you so much for those phenomenal poems. And I, I can never tell when people are reading if they're seeing uh, everyone live captioning essentially every line from like a line from each of those poems because they were phenomenal. Uh, that was really, really lovely, William. Thank you so much for being with us. Basil is, you know, standing, applauding, screaming for an encore. Um, and for those of you at home who are not Basil and can't see my document, that was William Erickson, who again, you can find on Twitter at Bill underscore P underscore Erickson, Erickson with a K E R I C K S O N, and on Instagram at underscore William underscore Erickson. Um, William has a an off format project of tiny poems that are coming out with Tilted House in the fall and a full collection coming out in early 2024, which is very exciting coming from April Gloaming. Um, he keeps a website mod modestly up to date, so you can find him at awkwardlypenned.com and keep your ear to the ground because all of those projects and books are going to be phenomenal. I cannot wait for them, and I'm sure all the listeners who've been blowing up the chat um, agree. So, wow, fabulous. I could not think of a better like apex into which to enter the back half of our reading order. And I also could not think of a better person to welcome back to performance anxiety to do that work than Sarah Matson. Sarah Matson has poetry in Bone Bouquet, Impossible Task, and the Sh Chicago Reader. Her full-length collection, Personal Fashion, was published by Swallowtail Press. Electric Grandma was published by Another New Calligraphy. And her microchap, Teenage Horror Nostalgia, was published by Ghost City Press. Sarah's newest chapbook, Special Features DVD Poems, is available from Alien Buddha Press. Sarah is on Twitter at Skeletor Writes. Sarah, thank you so much for being back at Performance Anxiety. Also, I forgot to mention Sarah ripped that uh, we do new shit at Performance Anxiety. So if you're going to read some new shit, Sarah, we will be ecstatic to hear it. Take it away. Hell yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you so much, Tom and Kristen, for having me back. I uh, really can't overstate how much I love performance anxiety and getting these words into people's homes and their computers is such a joy and I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start off uh, reading a, a poem uh, from my latest chapbook, Special Features, and it's super awesome. I have uh, Ben Nespajani's amazing words on the back of this book. So rad. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so this book is largely inspired by pop culture, TV movies. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read to the night, uh, tonight is inspired by Phantom of the Opera, uh, which is a very bizarre 1925 silent film, uh, as well as a Gerard Butler uh, <laughs> themed movie uh, from like 2003. So if you like crazy guitar riffs and, you know, half masks, Totally recommend it. Um, this poem is called Savor Each Sensation. Forgetful of cast, we waltz. Outlandish traces of decay swirling from hundreds of powdered costumes. The scent of dead silk wafting from curled arms of a real masquerade. Visage hidden in velvet and bone, my own face made small of clay and staked upon a jeweled staff. Dizzy pearls sewn into my scalp, menace blowing through my every feather while I let gargoyles press their flared stone nostrils to my cheek. Vaseline lensed terror, ominous undercurrent of lust, and ownership in tinted evening tender visuals. True lovers just smash their faces and doll parts together, kissing palms and flapping hands to deadly shadow, plastic mirror fantasy. A violent accent tripped my vowels into a ditch. Stretching each fiber, I snap the cord around my wrist and prepare to be indoctrinated. On tiptoe in emerald damp, I understand slice of ancient life, satin bindings in an eerie glow, ungrateful inspiration like swimming in a murky lake wearing a tuxedo. When he snatched your frown, I thought he snapped your neck, organs following falling from mutton sleeve, calling is visiting 
but intolerable heat can strip enough layers to lean and press. Imagine all of my colors spread for you. Running with palms tied together, iron gates crumble before I even glide past. Very 1920s chic. I learned insects inside leather chess meant more to you than you would ever admit. Tumbling from the mouth of the scorpion, we decide to drown together. Thanks a bunch. Um, I'm gonna do one more from ye oldie special features here. Uh, and this poem is inspired uh, by John Wick, uh, the film franchise largely. Uh, love me some Keanu Reeves, love me some absolutely obscene action sequences. Uh, so this poem is called Baba Yaga. The night of my impossible mm, task, I did my makeup in snuff film lighting, told voluptuous secrets to the spliced clone of my great great grandmother, into the fluorescent pool with you, Granny. Mascara wands bashed brains to sticky spots on damp final floor. My shining forehead distracts from left lid sleeping on the camera timer, clawing a lace flesh gown, I insisted. Bespoke and bulletproof, my solitary burden, like the warmth of hands wrapped around a limp body. You're too sensitive. Let them suffer for a little while, just a bit. Let them suffer. My sadness is a flea market tattoo hiding under a warm washcloth, my scent soaked into the fiber. Every reflection is a warning, corner of the eye extraction, betrayal exerted to the fog, crawling up my dimpled chicken legs and nowhere further. Thanks so much. Um, in keeping with uh, super awesome new shit for performance anxiety, I would love to read you a brand new situation that I'm working on. Um, so I am, this uh, poem is part of a, a larger project. Um, I'm looking to rediscover and unearth some of the awesome achievements that women have accomplished in the field of science that frequently are uncredited or unnoticed or ignored just because the person that discovered it happened to be a woman. Um, so my first inspiration tonight is from Mary Hebrea, uh, also called Mary the Prophet, um, who is considered to be the inventor, the creationist of alchemy <laughs> and uh, thus modern day chemistry. Let's let's make that leap. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so this poem is called Prophet. Bearded lisp of transmutation, prophet of arcane purity. She is found in the panacea distillation method, straining herself into the purest metal, heavy and polychromatic. Restrictive temple culture permeates divine vapor bath with hot breath stink. Born to lie, I wrap myself in the dead, invert nature, expose my mercury, corrupt language and tongue vipers. Infinite forms of organic progress requires the inorganic to achieve unity. Dissolution of axiomatic practice, dividing of methodical intent. Hoofed to the ground, sun seeds rooted to the sky, Dirt understands how stones work. I understand how the moon warts on my face process. Prickly, blasé, dissolvable. I shield myself with the names of my loved and dead, pressing myself small and strong, predicting the future one starlight at a time. Already been, already know. I stuff the vessel of the necromancer under yesterday's panty line and waft my precious herbs into the central nervous system, empowered by scent and the cool leaf of distortion mint. 
Thank you so much for having me back to performance anxiety. I really appreciate it. I'm Sarah Matson. Thank you so much, Sarah, for taking us on that ride and for always being a champion of performance anxiety's uh, new shit ethos. And that again was Sarah Matson, who you can find on Twitter at Skeletor Writes, S K E L E T O R W R I T E S. And Sarah's latest chapbook that we heard a little bit from Special Features is now available from Alien Buddha Press via Amazon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Sarah does not miss, so any book of hers that you get, uh, whether it's got my words on it, Ben's words on it, saying how cool it is, they are all there and they are all wonderful. Um, I am so glad, Sarah, that you were able to join us tonight. Um, and, you know, Basil is here, so this part will be a little less awkward, I guess, because normally it's like, what do you do when you introduce yourself? And the answer is, I'll just be like, you know, Basil, you can just say some words and read a bio. Um, he didn't prepare anything, though, so I think what I will just do is read. Um, that will happen. So I'm going to do something, and hopefully it'll work. Let's see. I'm going to try to do it one-handed, which is maybe harder than it should be. All right, if I do that, do you all see a beautiful thing on your screen? I saw some faces. Okay, perfect. Great. So uh, today is 316. So I'm going to read 316. Uh, if you see it out of context where I live, it usually means something kind of Jesus-y. And so I'm going to read a poem um, called Gethsemane. Before I do, I should say that uh, one of the reasons I, I'm excited to read, because I don't always read for performance anxiety, but one reason I'm excited to do so tonight is uh, between our last reading and now I got to announce that my new book, uh, Reclaimed Water, is coming out from Ornithopter in August. So I'm super excited. This poem is in that book. There are a couple uh, poems that I'll read tonight that are in that book. And then I'll read some stuff that's not in that book, too, just for fun. Um, but yeah, this poem is called Gethsemane. I'm too tired to write a story about a YouTube scaled abuse analyst. And maybe you are too tired to read it. So here is an outline instead. Tim wakes up at 3.37 a.m. He's on call. Some terrible sequence of things has been posted, and he, Tim, the desensitized, bands together with the algorithms to try to stop one kid from seeing whatever heinous thing is in the videos. Also, it's Mother's Day, and his little independent contracting entity is called 30 capital A lowercase g, and it's a running gag whether it's pronounced 30 ag, like Virginia Tech, or 30 AG, like a little mishearing of the year Jesus starts his ministry. The story doesn't work because either A, I have to think up something horrible to be in the videos, or B, I infinite jest it and the video is an unknowable, an unknowable black box for to know it is already to be lost, right, Basil? And neither of those gets me far enough to want to continue with it, even though I think it's a good premise, the idea of the scaled abuse analyst as a real job gels so cleanly with my own experiences on websites full of terrible things when I was younger. The casual infliction of evil through depersonalized means that now is just part of the fabric of internet existence. You can hardly avoid it. This guy on Twitter with two crosses in his display name liked a poem I posted and I saw his pinned tweet was a blog post, quote, how to protect your family from adult content, end quote. I'm thinking a play school bucket meeting the mid-Atlantic. When you read Welbeck, his poems have this kind of stuff happening on trains, sidewalks, the seeing of something a certain type of mother could deem unclean, would deem unclean, annunciations opposite. Welbeck's poems are oddly tender. For every Nous avons passé la nuit sans délivrance, there is also J'ai toujours eu l'impression que nous étions proches, comme deux fruits issus de la même branche. Surprisingly green flowers of early May. Coffee late in the morning, the fog already burned off the mountain. I used to think AD meant after death, but then with the BC meaning before Christ, what years did he live? That actually wasn't enough of a problem to change my mind about how it worked. It made total sense that someone could live outside numbered years, that a religion would accept its earthly king by not counting time until after, like a flood of gossip after the party, like communism after the party, like cleaning up rivers and other bodies of fresh water away my iniquity, like a razor scooter to the shin, drawing blood and a little bone and a few views before being taken down a few pegs to pray. 
All right, happy 316, everybody. Thank you for indulging a poem that takes on all the sins of the world. Uh, and in case you're wondering, the YouTube scale abuse analyst is uh, actually a real job. You can apply to be the person who watches all the really horrible stuff that people put on YouTube and you know take it down. So that's just a job that exists now. Um, so in the same vein, uh, same vein of you know internet communication taking on our, our pretty wild world. This is a, a small poem, it's a sonnet called Feel and Fine, and it'll be out uh, in this really wonderful book that C.T. Salazar and Casey Dodds are putting together called uh, Mid-South Sonnets, so sonnets from the mid-Atlantic and southern US. Um, it's called Feel and Fine. Basil's not gonna read this one. On the day the canned tarantula expires, arguably for the second time, a meadow, enters a poem as a transitional image while short eyes like kindergartners line up to go outside. The algorithm is winning because it is bringing you what you like. The Matrix starring a sun-dried tomato, a best-selling book made of worms, etc. There's a fever garden where you can forgive anyone for anything and the bodies piling up in it are feeling fine. The dynamic rating system they use to give feedback has been hovering around a 4.2 out of 5 for years. Mostly agreeable with a few curmudgeons. <laughs> I love how Basil is like, curmudgeons? Who? so rude. Um, anyway. Uh, one thing that's been kind of fun, this is this next poem is called Pack My Box with Five Dozen Liquor Jugs. And I like that when you get to like the end of putting a book together, you can just decide what poems you want to include because you like them, not because you particularly, you know, think they stand on their own aesthetic merit or anything like that. And this poem is my, like one of my favorites that's in the new book. Um, and the title, in case you've never run into it before, it's one of those things like uh, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, I think. So if you look really carefully, you should be able to find all of the letters. Letters A to Z in there. Pack my box with five dozen liquor jugs. The falcon is directed by an arm, begins Laura Jensen's poem, Memory. And then my head wants to go all, and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze for some reason. But that's Randall Jarrell walking in the mummification poem so that Thomas James and Grace Lake could run. Maybe more like a stream then, or a river. Anna, you deep, deep mystery. What are you saying in a line like, my little radish, am I neglectful enough? Sufyan, too, cracking my heart like a robin's egg, egg with my little Versailles. My little Versailles. An all-time great trick because Versailles isn't little at all. Like, why don't you get that it's only a trick that the moon is small? That's Ariana Ryan's. I didn't know which side of the street the printers was on until I saw the other side was the Holy Cross Cemetery and Mausoleum. We do not have enough money to pay for the whole print run. So now we are tethered to the future of money, AKA in debt, AKA in something poems alone don't solve. Thank you very much for indulging one line of uh, 4th of July, which is a little bit early. I think that's from 4th of July. Sufjan is a, a wonderful influence, and that's Anna Mendelssohn slash Grace Lake. Uh, Thomas James and Anna Mendelssohn also like wrote these, these incredible poems about mummies, and like there's a Mother's Day mother thing going on motif in in the new book. Uh, so it's totally totally felt, you know, just hopping on their their gravy train and stealing their lines. Uh, this is a short poem. It's called Reflection. The trees have the lake fully surrounded. So the lake makes like it's holding the sun. Hostage. So those poems are all pretty much in uh, reclaimed water. And I'm going to close by reading just a couple. Um, because like one thing that's kind of also fun about editing and putting together a book is like you can start to recognize things that are like after the book. Uh, or like post the book, um, which is a strange feeling because you sort of want to like part of me wants to jam everything in the book. And then part of me is like, no, 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 hold on to that. Like uh, like Rilke held on to the Panther poem. So uh, these two poems that are closing, this first one's going to come out in Lee Potts's wonderful um, Stone Circle Review, which I'm really excited about. It's a beautiful publication. Uh, it's called Orange Rural Fire. And then I'm going to close with a poem after it that uh, is kind of in reclaimed water and kind of not. 
Orange Rural Fire. This is a treatise on the art of wanting things you cannot have, whether it's because someone else has them and won't give them up, or because schools of fish are becoming more and more selective with time. The bigger pools of applicants winnowing slowly enough for them to get away with certain trickeries. Like a jut of metal near the stream, still appearing strong and straight, despite having witnessed years and years and years of rain. So an accidental deer nudge is enough to break it clean in two and set the rust flakes loose to brighten the mud. I end up doing that a lot, breaking things that aren't mine. The trick is to do it like the deer does it, not on purpose, but just because you were trying to get a drink that, whether or not you knew it, would put gross stuff in your blood and turn you into a problem. Cherry trees don't grow here natively. They have to be brought in and can't be shaded by bigger trees or buildings. They need deep, well-draining soil, six hours of sunlight a day. And if you don't care if the fruit is sour, that's really it. Surprise, it's not it. This is the last poem I'm going to read tonight. It's called Nothing at All. It has no title. And it's sort of in reclaimed water, and it's sort of not. I was making one last serious attempt at my hands. The palms bruised and caked with dirt after trying to get well water up through our overfine filter, which was like the opposite of an hourglass, the way it contained itself and swirled against gravity. I think the biggest con is thinking there's only one big love in one's life. And like a wave, you either catch it or you don't. And that in the former case, one should be celebrated and in the latter pitied or made tragic. What am I doing? I'm dancing like a March idea, like Chopin for whom dance was one of the languages like mathematics or love, both flattering instances of Polish culture when you think of our record in war. There is so much anti-trans stuff on social media right now, I am kind of lost. Alfred Tarski writes, quote, you will not find in semantics any remedy for decayed teeth or illusions of grandeur or class conflicts. Nor is semantics a device for establishing that everyone except the speaker and his friends is speaking nonsense, end quote. The deer don't say anything, and the birds, the birds are wrong loudly. Jack Spicer, who studied semantics, among other things, quote, they said he was 19. He had been kissed so many times, his face was frozen closed, end quote. Like a topological set, or a Massachusetts liquor store on Sunday. The aura is like rock bottom of a gift bag meets 10 flowers all dried out because we have no water, though they probably would have taken the dirty water just fine. Boston, you're not home. Jack at the BPL rare book room shuffling a series of circumstances into place that will make possible after Lorca and really all of the books in the collected books, which doesn't look back at any of the one night stands, has a healthy sense of shame that way. Like a shy bullet would rather stay in its casing than visit the brain of a heart. I did have one love. And then I had another and another. Rainstorms rolling over the mountain and through the river valley. Bright fog burning off for the dew to shine. Thank you all very much for tolerating the screen share. Uh, that was that was some stuff. Um, so yes, Reclaimed Water is going to have some of those things. It'll be out from Ornithopter in August. And you know, I'll pass the mic over to also me to scroll back up in that very same document and to tell you, um, first and foremost, loudest and clearest, thank you so much to all of our readers and our listeners, um, readers for sharing their beautiful work with us this evening, and our listeners for giving this hour of their lives over to poetry, whether you're listening with us in the Skype call or if you're um, listening to the YouTube recording. Thank you so much either way. Um, I also hope that if you're listening with the sheaf of new poems or fiction or anything at all close at hand, you might consider dropping us a line at performance ANXT on Twitter or via email. Um, you can reach us again at Poetry Books on Tape at gmail.com. We would love to hear your work at a future event. Our next one's on April 20th, auspicious date, uh, any third Thursday after that, right? We would love to see you there.
Um, to close tonight's reading, I'm going to follow in the grand performance anxiety tradition. You've heard plenty of me tonight, uh, so thank you again for, you know, loving that. I'm just going to read a short poem to end, which is not by me. This is from one of my favorite poetry books of all time, uh, the William Bronx Selected Poems. Uh, this poem is called Go Ahead, Goodbye, Good Luck, and Watch Out. You get to Gilead, let me know. That bomb supposed to be so good for human hurts, all wounds, holes, hollows, hungriness. You tell me if it's there and how it works. Till the time comes, I'll look for further ways with the old lack, the void. Push it along ahead of me in the only way we have to carry this luggage of ours of hungriness like an empty bag. What else is there to do? No kind of bomb. You look, though. Let me know.